on working with chronic musculoskeletal conditions. I'm Tony Wolfe from the Global Alliance for Musculoskeletal Health, and the coordinator of this session is Sarah Copsey from EU OSHA. And why this is an important session, but sadly not the most attended session, is that this is in recognition of the enormous number of people of working age who have musculoskeletal conditions, many of which are chronic, long-term, and not only cause pain, but affect their function and their ability to work. These are conditions such as osteoarthritis, osteoporosis with fragility fractures, rheumatoid arthritis and gout, but also chronic neck pain, back pain, sciatica, fibromyalgia, which impact on work, but will not necessarily have been caused by work. And these are increasingly a problem with the aging workforce. And one of the reasons that the numbers are not getting any better is that we generally have an aging workforce with increasing comorbidities and leading unhealthy lives, which again increases the prevalence of these conditions. So in recognition of this, part of the research program and the campaign, Lighten the Load, have considered how do we help people work who have chronic muscle seizure conditions. And the key thing is enabling people to work, and this clearly requires a multifactored, multidisciplinary approach involving employers and managers, the employee themselves, experts in occupational health and the healthcare team, all working together with a common goal of enabling people to remain in work. And we're going to hear presentations considering those different aspects. Some examples of how people can be helped work despite having these problems. Some steps people can take themselves in the workplace if enabled to do so, such as micro-exercises. And also the importance of early intervention, because we now do have very effective in interventions which can enable people to stay in the workplace. We also have some statements from organizations, again, clarifying what is necessary. And then we're gonna have a discussion to try and come up with some action points of what people should do, what employers should do, what employees should do, what healthcare workers should do, and are there any policy changes that we need to help make it all happen? So with that, I'd like to welcome Sarah Copsey, who's going to talk about the case studies that were identified in the research for this campaign. Thank you, Sarah. So well, the key message I want to start with is that people do not have to be 100% fit to work, and they can work around their problems, but they do need safe and healthy workplaces. Um, and within that, a health promotion as part of prevention, for example, back care programs or workplaces that promote activity, encouragement to report problems and open conversations for early intervention, and the commitment and understanding of their employer and individual assessments based on risk assessment. Uh, just, to, just a reminder that making work safer for all workers by applying the occupational safety and health legal principles of preventing risks at source and adapting work to workers can enable a worker with a chronic condition to continue working. And risk assessment must also cover workers who are particularly sensitive. The workplace the Occupational Safety and Health Workplace Directive also includes disability measures such as an accessible workstation and employment equality regulations require workers, employers to make reasonable accommodations for disabled workers. And the health and safety risk assessment process can help to determine the right measures. So, um, this is what I'm going to talk about. EU OSHA, as part of its work on musculoskeletal disorders, has published a good practice report with ex examples of workplace accommodations, how that works in practice, and also a 
case studies, eight case studies on return to work, and these were analysed for success factors. And also an article on psychosocial risks in relation to return to work after a musculoskeletal disorder. But my presentation focuses on the cases. Uh, the first case I want to talk to you about is um, a receptionist with osteoarthritis and osteopenia who had an accident that resulted in spinal fractures and damaged ligaments. But she was able to return by gradually building up her hours. Colleagues now help her with heavy postal deliveries. Ergonomic changes following risk assessment included a telephone headset that reduces arm movement, a more supportive footrest, easier to use storage drawers, and rearranging her work area to give her more space to get up and move. The fast implementation of the return to work process also helped her to return with minimal changes. And she can also take rest breaks when she needs to do so. And she commented that the appreciative organisational culture and the understanding and support of her colleagues probably did most to actually help her get back to work. The next case is a shop worker with a painful joint con condition who could continue working full time through being given a stool which she can use to reduce standing when she's not attending to customers. She now has flexibility to swap her <laughs> afternoon shifts with colleagues in order to attend medical appointments and she has access to a rest area to rest and lie down if needed. And again, colleagues help her to lift heavy boxes. And her, importantly, her own motivation, good communication, and the flexibility to change her shifts were key to her return to work. <coughs> In this case, a migrant hospital cleaner with back problems and the, what was important, the hospital already had a very good health promotion and ergonomics program, and this was backed up by leadership training. So these were already un, in place and underpinned the whole return to work process. She had a trusted line manager that kept in touch with her during her sick leave, and the cleaner was fully involved in planning her own return to work, which included short breaks to exercise and rest when needed, uh, her job was altered, so she no longer needed to climb ladders or lift heavy buckets, and there were some equipment changes. But now she also works in a team and can get help from colleagues if needed. Colleagues were fully informed about her integration uh, and were very supportive. And now at the end of each shift, each day, she speaks with her team leader about her workability as well. So the whole thing is monitored. And a big factor, a factor actually that led to her back problems was the fact that she was working extra shifts because she got some economic problems. So she was provided with support also to help her out with these financial problems. So she no longer needed to work the extra shifts. This case is a university lect lecture with osteoporosis. And key features in the case were an early diagnosis combined with various adjustments to help her self-manage her own condition. So she has access to a restroom and a gym to rest and exercise. She was able to modify her daily routine and she makes sure she walks a lot. She controls her workload and takes regular um, screen breaks. And again, she has support from colleagues for lifting and carrying. Right, and so this, this case now is a data, data entry worker with upper limb disorders. She was provided with voice activated software and risk supports. And I want to emphasize that before adoption of the equipment, trials were made of different ergonomic tools. Existing policies on flexi working and good existing ergonomic measures such as sit-stand desks for all staff also helped her too. And 
support from the organisation is ongoing, which makes her feel safe, and she can ask for a new individual risk, risk assessment on demand. Right, this case is uh, a police officer who had a number of painful conditions, partially brought on from wearing heavy personal protective um, equipment, um, a protective vest, and from prolonged static postures from, dr from driving. So he, he had to be moved to an office role, but this was only up, done after a, a thorough risk assessment was made to get the ergonomics right. Again, trialling the tools first and the support of manager were very important. And he also commented that, that the, these days they've, they've changed the protective vest. So he's pleased that his, his, new, his old colleagues now wear much lighter protective vests because he knew it was a, a source of his problem and therefore that, that removed some of the risk at source. Um, and it was very important for him that he had time to say his goodbyes to his former colleagues when he changed his role. Right, this case here is in fact me. Um, I was off sick for quite a long while with sciatica, so two measures I've used are a folding, perching uh, stool stick to avoid prolonged standing, and a special cushion which avoids pressure under my seat bones when, when sitting. So they were just two of the accommodations. So, oh, I nearly fell off that. This, this is the cushion, so very, very simple um, measure, but it's really, really helped, helped me a lot. Um, but what I want to emphasise from my own case is that I, I really need to f needed to feel in control of the return to work process, because it was cr absolutely crucial for taking away the fear I had that going back into the office could result in the, the pain coming back again. Right, so that's... Uh, so, so what we've seen is um, throughout the cases a, a lot of different simple measures for co continuing to work. So, and, and most with chronic MSDs can continue to work, providing some allowances made for the conditions. So things like ergonomic mouse, sit-stand desk, wireless headset for answering the, the phone, height adjustable desks, the help with the heavier tasks, ability to telework, a gradual return to work, and they've all supported workers with a chronic MSD to continue work. work. And none of these measures are complicated or, or expensive. And usually a combination of several measures is needed. As you can see that from the cases. And often they are measures that may also benefit the entire workforce. But a frequent comment is made, well, that's okay for office workers, but what can you do about physical work? But even here, lighter and electronically operated ergonomic tools can help. Also taking more frequent rest breaks, task rotation, teamwork, and swapping, <coughs> swapping heavier tasks. <coughs> reducing physical work for older workers, for example, by giving them a monitoring role. Um, and the other EU OSHA guide gives an example of a carpet fitter who carried on working by reducing his hours and the number of days he, he worked. So even then, if you have some flexibility, there's ways you can work around your problems. So, um, so the sex, sex success factors in the cases included employers showing commitment and support, focusing on the workers' capabilities, not their disabilities, effective communication and cooperation involving everybody in concerned, including the healthcare team, with the individual's permission, risk assessments to prevent risks and for making individual accommodations, gradually building up hours, through a phased return to work, a combination of measures and allowing enough time for trialling measures. And the measures also need to be reviewed 
to check that they work and if the person's condition changes. Existing company policies such as flex, flexi time teleworking in place will then help the return to work. And all the cases showed taking account of psychosocial factors such as giving individuals control over their return and how they work was crucial. Some, just to list some broader policy issues, um, small businesses often have a closer relationship with their workers and that, that can help the return to work process, but they need support. Um, return to work should be a clinical or treatment goal for healthcare professionals, so they should be involved in the, in the process. Early healthcare intervention is needed not only in the workplace, but also in healthcare. And we need joined up policy, interventions and budgets to provide this coordinated approach. Both workers and the employer and employers need external support, where multidisciplinary teams provide tailored support to the individual. And in general, we need improved occupational health services and universal access to such services. And employment and sickness schemes, systems in member states need to allow a gradual return to work. But unfortunately, still several or many do not allow such an approach to be taken. As we've seen, moving about was an, being able to, to move um, was an important point in the cases. Just to mention, EOS has also published practical resources on evolving avoiding prolonged static postures, which is equally important for working, or especially important for working with chronic musculoskeletal disorders. Three key messages to finish on. Make work easier for the whole workforce to enable an individual with reduced work capacity to remain in employment. Simple measures to support an in individual often benefit everyone, such as ergonomic equipment or flexible working. Making them available to everyone removes the stigma of having to ask for special treatment. And design inclusive workplaces for a diverse workforce, enabling the greatest number of people to enter the workforce and remain in work. This also minimises the need for individual accommodations, and this is known as universal design. Thank you very much for your um, attention. Right, okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. And it's clear that the case studies have brought out a lot of key issues of ways of enabling people to stay in the workplace. And it's good that a lot of those came from the individuals themselves as what they needed to help them stay in work. And also, I think it's good the way you link that up to what policy things are needed to enable <coughs> that to happen. So, any comments or questions? So any comments or questions? Yep. If you could just say who you are and where you're from. Now it's working, I guess. Yep. Maybe closer. <laughs> uh, I would like to thank uh, for your presentation. My name is uh, Selçuk Yashar. Uh, I'm the focal point manager uh, of Turkey. Uh, actually, I was really impressed when you uh, explained the situation about yourself because uh, we are all... Um, office workers having the uh, similar problems as I uh, experienced something uh, like you. Uh, I was really interested about that uh, you are using a cushion and a chair 
And uh, I would like to ask uh, the, um, the owner of this idea, have you worked with a professional to find this kind of solution? And also, uh, these are the instruments. Uh, have you received a kind of uh, treatment from physiotherapists or the other professionals? So uh, I know because it's like not uh, changing the situation and you are not healing at that time. It's a process. I experienced a similar thing during, during the pandemic because we were all working at home it was not like uh, starting at nine and finishing at six. We were all lost the uh, time dimension. So uh, I would like to ask you if you can summarize uh, this process. Right. Thank you. Um, it's always dangerous to ask a patient about their condition because they can then start going on for it about, uh, for a long time. Um, right, so in my, my, my case, of course, it was a kind of... Um, multi-factor return. So it, when I was first off sick, it took a while to get the right kind of medical diagnosis to find the right physiotherapist who was going to, to help me. And in, in fact, that turned out to be a sports physiotherapist who um, gave me a set of um, graduated exercises to do. So starting very because it was it basically mine is a as a muscular um, problem that one of the muscles, the gluteal muscles, contracts and it squeezes a sciatic nerve, and and that had to be released. And then I needed exercises to to, to strengthen that and the typical what they call the, the core muscles, the the other mu muscles which the, which take away the back, having to do with the abdominal muscles, leg leg muscles, etc. So. He gave me um, a very specific gra graduated exercise and he kept che checking my process and it was very strict. It wasn't just do this exercise. It was t 10 repetitions of this, 10 repetitions of that, 10 rep 20 minute program and, th and then we'll see you again and how you're doing and, and then that, that gradually changed. So, so that, that was very important on, on that side. And then um, it was really important having a very supportive work. The then head of administrations, she said to me, what, whatever you need, we'll, we'll do, do for you to get, get back to work. And I mean, I'm lucky, I'm an ergonomist. Um, I did my own research for things on, on Amazon. I'm, basically, I found every, everything on Amazon. I, I read the, and read the, the, um, the comments that different people had said, well, this perching stick, I, um, it's really helped me, um, for example, waiting in, in airport queues so I don't have to stand a long time, et cetera. And, and then th this cushion, a specialized cushion comes from an orthopedic shop because in the end I'd bought a few online, I was still getting, getting pain. And so I went to, it's designed for, for wheelchair users and they gave me um, a test to, to see what cushion relieved the pressure the most. So then I ended up with, with the cushion as well. But it's a, it's a whole load of gradual things. That, and then as the person learns to manage their own condition, you work out how long you can sit for, how long you can stand. I'm very strict with a timer about how long I can sit before I stand, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I was, Coming back to work was, um, was an hour checking emails at home and three hours in the office. And now I work 80% 80, 80 of the, the time, so that's six and a half hours. So a gradual process, I, I still have to manage the situation so I don't go backwards. But that's, well, that's, that's, a, that's a summary over, over a seven year process that it's been. So thank you very much for that, Sarah, and being so open. But it is an example of many thousands of people around Europe who have this problem. And I think it exemplifies the person needs to know what the problem is and get the right medical advice about what they should do, preferably in a timely way. Uh, and then in the workplace, then being enabled to follow that advice. But it is around 
the person, I think Sarah highlighted also that individuals want to know what to do, they want to be in control. And if someone's been off work with a painful condition for a while, they're very nervous and anxious about getting back to work because they don't want it to come back again. So it's actually building that up and enabling flexibility. And my impression is that COVID has got across to a lot of employers that flexibility does work and people can still be productive even if you allow them to be flexible and do a combination and gradually increasing their hours. And I think when it comes to the policy level, it is this thing in many social security systems, like in the UK, it tends to be binary. You're fit or you're not fit to work. And they don't enable that gradual return to work with an appropriate income to happen. So we have to look at how do we enable individuals to do the right thing. So thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're now going to move on to uh, the second speaker who's going to join us remotely. So I'd like to welcome Lars Anderson, who's a senior researcher at the National Research Center for Working Environment in Copenhagen. And his research combines methods from health science, sociology, and psychology to, to promote a healthy and productive working life in different job groups. Currently working on the Danish and EU projects to prolong working life. He's unable to join us in person, so he's, as I said, joining us remotely. So he's supposed to get a focus around enabling physical activity. So, Lars, and hopefully you can hear us and we can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, thanks. Can I share the screen now? Okay, I hope I hope it can I should I square share the screen. Okay, okay. Thanks, guys. I hope you can uh, you can see my presentation. Okay, let's get started. We only have uh, 12 minutes, so I'll do it uh, briefly. I'm Lars Andersen. Uh, I'm a professor at the National Research Center for the Working Environment in Copenhagen in Denmark. We've done a lot of uh, studies with physical exercise at the workplace during the last uh, 15 years. So I'll make a quick walkthrough of some of the main findings of, of these studies and how they can relate to musculoskeletal disorders. So, what I call micro exercise, I just want to define briefly here. So, micro exercise are these short, brief bouts of exercise that you can do at the workplace, wherever you are and as you are. So, there's no need for changing clothes or using a lot of transport time to go into a gym. So, it could, for example, be three times 10 minutes per week with elastic bands or dumbbells or whatever type of exercise equipment that you have at hand that you find most useful. And it, in general, it works best if you do it together with the colleagues at the workplace. And the good thing about this is that it's very inclusive. Everyone can participate because you can easily regulate the resistance level. For example, if you use bands or dumbbells, you can easy, easily regulate the weight. With elastic bands, you can change the length or the color of the elastic bands so that even the weak ones or the very strong ones can participate. So an overview of the findings that we have done during the last 15 years is that these types of micro exercise done at the workplace can reduce pain in the neck, shoulder, arm, and back. It works across job groups. So we have found that it works in different types of jobs, not only office workers, but also those with more physical, physical demanding jobs. And there are some positive adaptations, both in the muscles and the brain. It also improves collaboration between colleagues. We can see that when we measure um, the level of collaboration between colleagues uh, after doing 10 weeks of exercise. And even as little as two minutes per day of exercise can help. It won't get people pain-free, but at least it, it's better than doing nothing. And it also helps to prevent sickness absence. I'll show one of the studies on, on this also. And it's important to underscore here that it cannot uh, replace the health and safety efforts at the workplace, but it's something that should add to the existing efforts. 
so please ensure a good work environment before uh, adding these things on top. The first study that we did um, with this research was um, a small study with 42 participants, office workers with chronic neck pain, who were randomized into three groups. A control group that got some advice about adjusting the table and the chair and the lights and the screen and so on. A group that did strength training for the neck and shoulder muscles. So they actually trained the painful part of the body, with high intensities, eight to 12 repetitions maximum for about 20 minutes, three times a week. A third group that did cycling with the legs. So they just relaxed their painful necks while they did cycling with the legs because we had an idea that maybe just getting the level of fitness up might uh, help with the pain also. And actually we had no idea which type of exercise would work better because by then there were very little research on this. So what we found was that, well, um, only the strength training group that did these exercises for the painful muscles in neck and shoulder, well, they decreased their muscle pain intensity during these, on average, 25 training sessions during 10 weeks. This is the pain intensity. You can see here that goes down. And even with 10 weeks of detraining, well, the pain increased a bit when they stopped training, but it stayed at a, at a level in the strength training group that was about half of that in the control group and in the cycling group. So we could from this say, well, if you train the parts of the body that's, that are really painful, you can decrease the pain. We also divided results into those who were youngest and those who were oldest in the strength training group, and they had the same results. So age is no barrier to participate in this and get the benefits of decreased pain. We, also, we have also done studies where we have compared different types of training equipment, and it doesn't really matter if you use dumbbells, elastic bands, or something similar, as long as you can train the painful areas of the body with a relatively high intensity, something corresponding to what you could also call strength training. We have tried this in different job groups with similar results. So we have tried it in office workers, laboratory technicians, in slaughterhouse workers, in nurses and nurses aides. And in these studies, the exercises have been specified for the muscles that they need to train the most. So for example, for the nurses, they've also got some strength training exercises, not only for the neck shoulder, but also for the lower back because they do a lot of, well, they can't really not allow to lift the patients, but they do use their back a lot during work. It's really difficult to avoid that. And we found in all these job groups, the same results regarding the pain reduction after 10, 15, 20 weeks of, of specific strain training for these muscles that are at risk and are, can be painful or at risk of, of getting overloaded during work. The latest study that we published this year is a, it's not a randomized study, it's a cohort study where we followed 70,000 workers for two years in a national register. So we could see who went on long-term sickness absence, which is defined here at least as 30 days of continuous sickness absence from work. And we could see that all well, those who did these micro exercises at the workplace with together with their colleagues, they had a reduced risk, even when controlling for all kinds of confounders, they had a reduced risk of long-term sickness absence, those who did these micro exercises. We also tested whether this was influenced by age, sex and education, and it wasn't. So we can say, well, it helps both for the younger ones, the older ones, for the men, for the women, for those with short or no education, and for those with long education. If we scale this up and calculate how much would we then be able to prevent of all sickness absence in all of Denmark, the country of Denmark where the study is done, well, we would be able to prevent 13% of all long-term sickness absence if all workplaces implemented these micro exercises. So 
Of course, 87 percent it wouldn't be able to be prevented by this, meaning that long-term sickness absence is influenced by a lot of things, which is why it's important to to do some efforts to do uh, to work on a good work environment in general, and not only uh, doing micro exercise. But it can help, uh, and 13 percent is actually a lot. So how to do this in practice? Well. First of all, it's important to say this should not only be up to the individual motivation to do this. So the workers should do this together in groups so they can help each other and even just to remember to do it. And the leader or the manager, the line manager should, should support this and approve this. So the workers don't have to do this. Uh, you know, if you don't really know, it's, are we allowed to do this working or doing working hours or not? It's difficult to do it in the long term. So the leader or the manager should support this. It should even be taken up to the top management level and put more into system. So as part of the work environment organization, the HR and so on, so that when new people come into the workplaces, they're shown where the office was, a coffee machine was, a container. Well, here also some uh, small micro exercises that we do Monday, Wednesday, Friday at two o'clock. And then people sort of get this in already when they start at the workplace. Another thing is, well, as I said in the beginning, wherever you are and else you are, uh, it should be something that you can do without having the need to change in clothes or going to a gym because then it's a very few selected people that will do this in the long term. So you should be able to do it like here shown in the office, just getting up, doing the exercises, having a good laugh with the colleagues while you do it, and then work on with whatever you were working with. A lot of people prefer to have some simple illustrations because then if you are beaten out, what should I do? You can look at the illustrations, some short key points. Well, I can do these four exercises. There are three key points on how to do it. There are some illustrations. So because if you're in doubt, it's easier not to do it than to do it. So it can help with some simple illustrations. It's also good to put time in the calendar, for example, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever fits best at three o'clock, at two o'clock before lunch, whatever fits best for the working team. So we get this in as, a, as, a, uh, as something you get used to doing during the week. And as I all said in the beginning, do it in groups. It seems to work the best because people can help each other and they can also re remind each other to do it. And the, it's also a, a social thing to do it together. The last thing, find somebody in the beginning to get this going because even though I said it's not up to the individual motivation to get this done, it's, it has to start with someone. So find someone who's really, really burning to get this going at the company. It may be you looking at this now who wants to start this at your company. So now you know a bit more, a bit more about how to do it. So a simple program in practice could be something like this: three times a week, you do four exercises. It could be these or other exercises, as many repetitions as you can. When you can do more than twenty repetitions, if you really do an effort, then it's way too light. You have to make the, if you use elastic bands, make it shorter or change to the next color of elastic bands. If you use dumbbells, go to the next weight so it gets a bit heavier. And don't use any more than one minute of rest uh, between the exercises. And you can also get some, do some variation, vary the order of the exercises. And after some weeks, when you get bored of doing these exercises, then introduce some new exercises. So the motivation uh, continues. So that's it. Maybe there's, there's time for questions. Thank you, Lars, for that and highlighting how something relatively simple to do, providing people do it, can make such a difference. Uh, Questions and comments, including anything coming in online. Yeah, if you could just say who you are, where you're from. Hello, uh, I'm Lucy, uh, focal point manager of France. 
thank you very much for your presentation. It's really interesting. Uh, uh, I have a, a comment and a question. I don't know if there is a ne Netherlands uh, people in uh, in the uh, room, but uh, in the Netherlands they do also a campaign uh, of exercise uh, at uh, at the workplace and uh, works uh, really great. And uh, my question was, uh, how do you how do you reach uh, entrepreneurs and workers, and uh, how do you know uh, the results of uh, of this um, um, work? <laughs> Thank you. Could you repeat the last part? How, what do you say? How do you wits? Uh, how do you wits um, enterprise employers and workers? How do you reach uh, employees? Oh, oh to reach, to reach them. Them. all. Yeah. Well, of course, in the in the randomized study, it's it's quite selected companies because it's voluntary to participate both on the individual side and, of course, also the companies. So. Um, so what we have done, uh, how we have reached them or recruited them, well, it's we from the beginning we have had a lot of personal contacts at companies, and uh, in the type of research that we do, I can't come up, uh, can't think of much research we have done where we haven't involved companies. So we already had good contacts at the companies when we started this type of research. So, so of course, course you need, uh, yeah. but otherwise, if you if you need to recruit on the company level, um, you may use uh, social media and things like that. I don't know what, what would work, work best, best in your country, but at least um, it's it's not been a problem for us because we already have a lot of contact with companies. So, are you working with the companies and the management of the companies, or do you also involve the unions and the worker representatives? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's both the the it's both the labor unions and the employer side that are involved in in the research also uh, on the context that we have. So it's it's important to get both sides in on this to get support from them. Um, but that's, that's usually part of getting, getting the, funding the funding also because where we apply for funding is is. Um, well, there has to be some decisions on who should have the money in, in the end, and it should be something balanced that's in, in the interest of the employer side and the, and the labor union sides also. Outside the studies, do you know how long people are continuing with the programs? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that would probably depend on on many factors. If you only if it's only up to the individual, it will die out quite quickly. So that's why it's important to get it up at a higher level. Uh, so you make it do it in a more systematic way. Because if it's up to the uh, motivation of the individual, it's sort of the adherence to will sort of go down quite quickly. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, from Turkey. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting to see the results of this research with lots of participants. It was the most interesting part for uh, me. And I would like to ask you, uh, to show the audience maybe this could be a kind of interactive between you and us because we arrived here uh, at uh, two o'clock, was it? Yeah, and just we had two breaks and can you show us some micro exercises that we can do now? I don't have a paint, I don't have an elastic paint here but I think it would take too long, but uh, otherwise, uh, this is our some meeting in a conference back. Your breaks there for tomorrow. In the next meeting, uh, Sarah, in the conference bag, there could be some elastic bands. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michaela Strebel, Aufa, Austria. Um, do you think that these effects are also in, in, in exercises without 
the bands so that you can transfer these effects on other exercises as well. That would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at least if you look at pain on the neck and shoulder, the best evidence for what works is a strain, type of strain training exercises. So you can do it with elastic bands, with dumbbells and machines and so on. But it's important to get some intensity in the training to get the best effect. And if you're not able to do that, or if it doesn't motivate you, then any type of exercise is better than no exercise. But at least for the pain, for the neck and shoulder, uh, it's the, the most efficient is a, is a strength training exercise. So, so just the body weight is, is too less, so it, me, it needs more, more intensity in the exercise. No, no, I'm not, I, that depends on which, which exercise you do. I know a lot of people who can't even do five push-ups. So that means you actually lift a lot of weight. So that depends on the exercise. But the, the good thing about using some dumbbells or, or elastic bands is that you can uh, actually train the muscles that you want to. If you only use your body weight, it's difficult to train your neck and shoulder. So how would you do that? You would have to stand on your head or something to train your, your neck muscles. So that's, that's a bit difficult. Okay, okay so thank, thank you, you very much, Lars. And I think it would, we could carry on discussing types of exercises, but I think the key message is that most of us are physically inactive. And the more activity, the better. The more stress, the more strengthening of the muscles, the better. And that there are some simple approaches which can be used in the workplace uh, to enable people to do exercises. But obviously, as we're going to hear later, if people have already got a chronic muscle seat condition, they may be needed to some modification of the exercises, but anything is better than nothing. And for example, in the UK, we have a program called From Couch to 5K, which is encouraging people who sit and do nothing to start doing five kilometers of brisk physical activity, walking or jogging or running on the basis that anything is better and a step at a time. And I think this is something which is very important. So thank you very much, Lars, for highlighting, and in particular for providing the data uh, to show that it really does make a difference. Okay, okay. thanks, and enjoy Bilbao. Sorry we can't interact with you face to face, but next time. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, who is Lydia. Abasolo. Uh, Lydia is a rheumatologist and a research coordinator of the Rheumatology Clinic Unit in the Hospital uh, Clinico San Carlos in Madrid and Head of Research in Information, Infection, Immunity and Allergy uh, in the Health Research Institute. And she's carried out a lot of work on work disability and the importance of early intervention. Once technology is sorted out. So good I'd like to welcome. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation to this session. I think it's an opportunity to share our experience in this field, and I hope you will find it uh, useful. So in this slide, just the index of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, I will give you a general picture of the impact on this, uh, of disability. Then uh, I will talk about our research in this field, then the dissemination, and finally, we will tell you about application <coughs> focusing in our uh, uh, musculoskeletal program in Madrid. Okay, as everybody knows, Rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, or RMDs, um, include a broad spectrum of diseases. And in general, they have a high incidence. Most of them have chronic course. And although the mortality is low, they have a high impact in quality of life in terms of pain and disability. Thus, this, is, uh, this results in a great socioeconomic impact. So, um, Disability in musculoskeletal diseases are the main cause of uh, disability in the European Union. It's around 20% of total days live with disability. And 
it has not changed for 20 years, as you can see in the graph. In this other graph, we can see the incidence of disability by different causes and divided in different age meant, uh, uh, segments of age. And two important uh, things. First of all, is that it seems that disability is an increasing issue as it has a uh, rise from 1999 to 2019. Another important thing and re related to our MDs is that it's not only for old people. It starts to appear in adolescence and increase from 20 to 65 years, that is the working population age. So we have to take into account that work disability is a complex problem. This is the result of three interrelated but independent processes. One is the health system process, where is included uh, the healthcare providers, primary care specialized or inspection services. The other is the work context where it's including, included the employees, employers, or uh, the occupational health. And the last one is uh, the administrative environment that is in charge of the economic uh, compensation of those people on sick leave. Uh, I belong to this health system process, and we decided to change the course of work disability, or, well, we, we decided to try to change the course of work disability. In the late 90s, uh, our chief, that was uh, Dr. Juan Angel Jover, hypothesized that there was a window of opportunity in recent disability, regardless of the disease, that if you act faster uh, with appropriate treatment, people could recover faster. So all of this was materialized in different research projects, and the main one was a clinical trial that has been published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Briefly, it was a voluntary randomized control intervention study well, with inclusion and follow-up 12 months each. We included more than 13,000 episodes of temporary war disability related to RMDs. <coughs> and we randomized, th these episodes were randomized either to control group that received usual care by the GPs or the early intervention program that was carried out by trained rheumatologists. So what was the main outcome? The main outcome was the difference between groups in the duration in, these, uh, in days of this temporary war disability. Uh, the relative efficacy was the percent of days saved per patient by the program. But we also measure the number of uh, permanent war disability proposals and uh, the difference between groups, and also the patient satisfaction, and finally, we performed an economical analysis. Regarding the intervention program, it had to be early, and it consists in protocolized clinical management made from specific syndrome diseases based on management, duration, and location. It had three growing levels of complexity uh, depending on timing of diagnostic tests and more complex management in a stepwise manner. But of course, the clinical judgment of the rheumatologist was also very important. What could I highlight from this program? Well, I think it was patient focused and I think this is a very important key point of this program. Patient learned how to make physical exercises and uh, they were self uh, they, 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 will, they were empowered and, and learned self-management. And another important point of this program, it was uh, we support the patients for the return to work. Okay, here I show you in this Kaplan-Meier failure curve, the percent of patients back to work over time. So if we see the curves, uh, at the beginning they rise fast but start to differentiate favoring the intervention group early in time. So as a summary, we obtained 39% of reduction of TWD duration, 50% reduction of uh, permanent war disability cases. I think this is, it, it was surprising, but I think this is a very important issue we found with an increased patient satisfaction and also a positive economic evaluation in terms of decreased direct and, and indirect costs. The benefit cost at two years was for one euro invested, 
the program returned 11 euros. That means uh, around 5 million euros of benefit. But this efficacy was not the same in all clinical entities. We ranged from 11% to 72%. Here we show you some examples. And uh, carpal tunnel syndrome was the highest clinical entity in efficacy, achieving 72%. Whereas internal knee pain uh, only achieved 11% and was the only clinical entity that didn't achieve statistical significance. It makes sense due most of them needed surgery for a completely recovered. Okay, after the trial, we extend the program through six health areas of Madrid. And uh, here in this table, you can see the, 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 the results. The efficacy was around 39% and the net profit in, in, during all of these uh, seven years was around 87 uh, million of euros. I think it's not about business, okay? Here in the right, you can see all the publications we have performed with this research. And now, regarding the dissemination and considering the complexity of work disability, we have to act at different levels, from policymakers and, administrat and administrators, including work disability in the rheumatology strategic plans from the social security and labor through funding programs and support programs. In this sense, we performed uh, early intervention programs launched through the Fit for Work Coalition in Spain by private funding until 2017. We included 23 early intervention clinics in public health in eight different regions of uh, Spain. And we measured the efficacy and it was around 30-40%. Okay, uh, more recently, agreements between uh, the National Institute of Social Security and different region, uh, re, regions sorry, started to appear, and specifically in Spain, uh, uh, an agreement between uh, the, this National Social Security and the healthcare providers of Madrid, that is called CERMAS, uh, were, were established and have crystallized in this uh, pilot program of the community of Madrid since uh, 2019. In this dissemination, we can't forget the role of health professionals. We have, uh, all, of, all of health professionals, we have to consider work disability as a clinical problem and not only as a, a health or occupational problem. We have to act, coordinate and as a team. So focusing in this uh, pilot program of Madrid community, it was the result of this coordinated action between primary, specialized and inspection services. And well, I have to tell you that it, the inclusion criteria and early intervention program was mainly the same that, uh, that, that, uh, that this uh, intervention program applied in the clinical trial. One very important difference we could not be able, uh, we, we can't be able at the moment perform the administrative task and in the clinical trial uh, we, we could uh, do it. So based on data from previous years and uh, taking into account the um, uh, available resources we have from the national social security that was around 1 million e euros per year and also considering that a rheumatologist would be able to attend 800 new episodes with their consecutive uh, follow-up visits for a year, we calculate the, uh, the needs and an uh, achievement was established with the uh, CERMAS. So the target points were uh, to attend at least 5,600 uh, new episodes per year and to see the patients as soon as possible as possible. In, in fact, the achievement was at least 95% of the patients had to be seen, had to be attended in the first month from sick leave. In the first year we measured all of these and we didn't achieve <coughs> the target. But we have to take into account that all the beginnings are progressive, slow, and moreover, in the last part of this year, the COVID appeared. But uh, the last measure that has been in 2021, we achieved both targets. So 
with, uh, we, we wanted to measure the efficacy of the program. And here I show you the flow chart uh, we used uh, to analyze all these patients, but we just analyzed the first nine months of recruitment. So from these three health areas of Madrid, uh, temporary ward disability episodes were identified by a digital platform that it was called IT Web, and um, we identified 18,000 processes. This uh, platform has also an algorithm that is able to estimate the uh, possible duration of these episodes uh, with um, variables like sex, age, or physical conditions. And from those episodes estimating in less than five uh, days, we excluded from the program. So we had 12,000 episodes. From those episodes, we excluded from the program because uh, we couldn't contact the patient or because, uh, mainly because they were bad classified, pregnancy and surgeries. So we tried to contact, we contact 5,700 people and uh, we couldn't, uh, we don't, uh, uh, um, the patients don't join the program because again, uh, they were pregnant or surgery or because the patient declined, uh, mainly because they were being attended by other specialists. So I have to tell you that the telephone contact was always in the second or third day from the sick leave form. So to make the comparisons, uh, we use this intervention group and for uh, control groups, we use, uh, first of all, uh, patients not contacted due to full agenda or wrong phone number, and we make another comparison with patients contacted and refused to be attended to the program because they were under um, the care of other specialists. So in both comparisons, we achieved statistical significance and the relative efficacy was uh, in one case 10% uh, and in the other was 34%. Uh, we have to I have to tell you that this is just a preliminary analysis because we couldn't uh, adjust for other confounding variables such as uh, clinical conditions or, or uh, age or, or sex because we couldn't be able to obtain data from the control group. So we have talked about the past. We have talked about uh, what are, uh, is going on in Madrid, but I would like to tell you some ideas about the future. Of course, uh, we would like to keep the current goal. We would like to obtain this administrative task because uh, I have to tell you when a patient uh, is ready to return to work, he can't return to work until he meets an appointment with a GP that gives uh, the patient the ending form. And this process lasts a medium of uh, three to five more days, okay? Um, if we have more money, we could expand the program. We could include more number of healthcare professionals, increasing the number of uh, episodes seen. Uh, it can be rheumatologists, primary care physicians, and orto orthopedics. All of them with the skills acquired to, try to treat these processes. We also add to the program other specialists for more complex patients, for instance, psychologists or orthopedics, surgeons. Uh, more healthcare uh, uh, areas included, more regions of Spain, and even we could cover other temporary ward disabilities uh, specialities uh, like psych psychiatry. Uh, I don't know in other countries, but in Spain, health uh, physical care physician is in one place, rheumatologist is an, in another place, inspection services are in another place, so it could be easier for the patient to have a single physical space, okay? And why not in the medium term, I think it would be nice to close the circle and involve the labor domain through fast track access in companies, employee self-assessment education, primary and secondary prevention groups. Okay, this is the last slide and just uh, the key of success of our program. Uh, it's a, a simple fast track, uh, including expert clinical management, it's patient focused, and it's the result of a coordinated action of health 
healthcare system. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lydia. And it shows that if you can have a system which makes sure people get the right care at the right time, yeah. that it can make a difference and have a significant, not only personal impact, but also economic impact from the point of view of the employers and the social security systems. Uh, but I think it is a challenge of how to get that to happen in various health systems in different countries. And I know, for example, in the UK, where we have enormous waiting times for mustard-seedal services following COVID and not having caught up, there is, in a way, no way that we could get that to happen at this moment in time. And I think it is thinking of ways of getting around that. But any other comments or questions or any experiences of other ways of getting early intervention? And I think there's something online. Thanks. A question from Pedro Reis online. He is asking for the role of occupational physicians in this setting that you have been describing or in Spain in general. Okay. Um, well, the clinical intervention, uh, the point was to integrate uh, usual clinical procedures, including also occupational health, in a sole point that was the rheumatologist. The rheumatologist was in charge of uh, making uh, the clinical management, but also the first step of rehabilitation and occupational health. We gave the patient ergonomic notions and explained the, the exercises, and, and we made this in this intervention program. Okay. So thank you, and I think it will be an issue in different countries, settings about who is the right person for them to see, and the way we've dealt with it in the UK is to think about the competences people need. Yeah, I think this is a point. Not necessarily who they are. Yeah. Uh, and for example, there have been some programs where health advisors have been put in place within the workplace who can see people early without them even having to go off work to see someone to get advice. So I think it is a matter of, and it would be good to hear from anyone else about innovations of how do you ensure early access to the right sort of care. Because it works. I mean, the early access works. Because basically it works and it pays for itself. Any other comments? So thank you very much indeed, thank you. Lydia. Thank you all. So I think that shows some good case studies of what has helped people, that there are simple programs such as self exercises that people can do which will make a difference but particularly in this arena where we're talking about people who have got a muscle-seedal problem if you can make sure they have timely access to the right care that really can make a difference we're now going to move on to some statements uh, as listed in the program from different organizations about what they think are some of the key issues. If you could make your way up, because then the panel discussion will include all of us. Yes. Discussing position. Yep. That's it. Yep. Okay. So I'm now wearing my hat as co chair of the Global Alliance for Muscular Health. And this is an alliance which was launched in 2000 as a bone and joint decade, bringing together a global alliance of professional, scientific, and patient organizations working to promote muscle-cetal health and muscle-cetal science worldwide to reduce the burden and cost of muscle-cetal conditions to individuals, carers, and society by raising priority for muscle-cetal health and promoting policies to achieve this, being endorsed by the UN and working with WHO and countries across the globe to try and achieve these goals. And I've already shown you this slide, 
and Lydia also showed you a version of this data showing the enormous burden due to these conditions, particularly in working age people. So it's not something which just affects older people, which is one of the myths we have to bust. There's a whole variety of conditions, but the commonality is that they cause pain, affect physical function, and that limits work capacity. And we know that participation in paid work increases self-worth, self-esteem, economic independence, and social inclusion, which may translate into better health and better quality of life. So really people need to be enabled to stay in the workplace because it's good for them, it's good for their families, and also it's good for society as a whole. So a key message in enabling this happen is to recognize it's a shared responsibility of all members of society to enable this. And good practice includes early intervention, which we've heard around, access to support mechanisms, including occupational health and rehabilitation, good communication between the worker and the employer, flexibility, we've heard that very much from the case studies, and ensuring good ergonomic practice in place appropriate to the individual. And one of the simplest and most efficient solutions is good employee-employer relationships based on good communication. So a good workplace is one which recognizes the importance of muscle and health, takes preventative action in reducing the risks, promotes physical health, encourages and supports early intervention, and accommodates early effective rehabilitation with everyone knowing what they can and should be doing to help achieve this. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Monica Chaba from the European Commission, DG Employment, to talk about disability and inclusion. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to zoom out a little bit. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for, for inviting the European Commission for being here. It's, a, it's a, of, with great interest that I listen to all these examples. But we in the European Commission work from a sort of different level. We don't, these kind of examples do not ever or very rarely reach us. We look at the data. We look at the data on the EU level, not even national, uh, but, but EU level. And what we, what we see is quite a disadvantaged situation of persons with disabilities <coughs> on the labour market. So what we see is a huge inactivity rate of 50%, meaning one out of two persons with disabilities is, uh, is inactive. We see a very substantial gap in employment of persons with disability compared to persons without uh, disabilities. And also uh, uh, what Tony was just saying, you, you've mentioned so social inclusion, social exclusion. We see a, a quite a substantial number of persons with disability who are at risk of poverty and social uh, exclusion as a result. So uh, what we decided to do when we were drafting a strategy for the rights of persons with disability, you see the strategy there at the left uh, corner, it's, it's issued, it's for 10 years, for 2021-2030, we thought we need to focus on employment of pers persons with disabilities. And uh, in fact, we made employment of persons with disabilities one of the flagship initiatives of, uh, of this strategy. And I hope I will be able, yes, I've succeeded. So um, the, the way uh, that the European Union works is, as I said, we, we take this macro perspective, we look uh, at, the, at, at the EU as a whole, uh, and we, we usually come up with recommendations or directives with, with legal instruments, but this is the domain that is really the competence of the member states, which, which means that the EU doesn't really have the competence. However, we do have a, a directive. This is the Equality Directive that, uh, from the 2000, which, uh, which, uh, which uh, um, for, forbids discrimination on the basis of disability. Nevertheless, uh, in, in spite of this uh, di directive, we still see what, what we're just talking about, these this, this high rates of unemployment, uh, high rates of uh, inactivity, but also uh, persons with disabilities, about 50% of persons with disability in a workplace report being discriminated. So we thought that we need to come up with a we call it disability employment package that would be sort of a different a different uh, 
uh, initiative that we usually do. So it's not a recommendation, it's not a directive. We want to design a set of guidance and mutual learning uh, opportunities for employers mainly. So we really would like to reach this local level and come up with a very useful and easily usable uh, recommendations, sorry, initiatives, guidance that cover, as you can see, all stages from recruitment through prevention, hiring perspectives, ensuring reasonable accommodation, prevention, uh, retaining of persons with disability at work, return through vocational rehabilitation, but also uh, transition to the, work, uh, to the open labour market. Because uh, here in this setting we talk very much about open labour market, but there are a lot of persons with disabilities who work in so-called sheltered employment and we want to look at this um, as well. And uh, we are extremely pleased to be working with EU OSHA and EU OSHA will uh, work on two of the guidance, uh, the guidance on retaining persons with disability in employment and the guidance on securing vocational rehabilitation schemes. So we've seen a lot of very good practices, hopefully they will fit into uh, into, the, into the guidance and for me it's, this is a great opportunity to be here and to listen to you today to make sure that we make this guidance most effective, that it will have the desired outreach to the local level and that it could be useful for the employers, for, uh, for employees organizations, for public authorities and for employees. Thank you very much. I hope I, uh, I, uh, I was within four minutes. <laughs> I think that's excellent and very encouraging. So, now I'd like to invite Patrice, who is going to speak on behalf of the Societal Impact of Pain platform, Thank you. being a board member of the European Pain Federation, EFIC, and a professor of anaesthesia at the University of Aberdeen. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, so I'm working in Scotland, but I'm originally from um, Brussels. Um, and I chair um, the SIP platform, and SIP is a partnership between the European Pen Federation EFIC, uh, which represents 20,000 uh, healthcare professionals working in the field of pain in 38 countries, and uh, Pain Alliance Europe, who co chairs um, SIP, and Pain Alliance Europe is a, uh, an umbrella uh, organization um, representing 800,000 people um, living with pain. And SIP uh, aims uh, to raise awareness on pain and all what we have heard today is mostly about raising awareness uh, and, but, but also uh, influencing pain uh, policies and that's, that's important of course, especially when we speak about implementation and support. So in 2021 and uh, 22, our um, um, uh, priorities, especially we, uh, looking at uh, objectives and uh, policies, were including um, employment, impact of pain on employment, and uh, also what does it mean for workers and for people living with, with pain. And in 2021, we published uh, a position paper on workplace and integration and um, uh, adaptation, and then we continued, and in 2022, um, we targeted the EU social pillar, disability strategy, and health and, and safety network. And uh, then I'm happy to, to come with a few um, very concrete action points um, uh, uh, today. And then we have here six uh, recommendations and very concrete uh, points. And uh, first of all, raising awareness of, of pain is also speaking about bio, psycho, social uh, factors linked to pain, so not only pain intensity, but uh, also a physical status, we have uh, spoken about that, and finally uh, distress, and distress also uh, means that we have to consider mental and physical health needs of workers, and also in other areas, um, including inclusion, transport, digitalization, and cross-border equity. Um, if I can just highlight digitalization, that means also we need to implement some specific tools, and we may speak about uh, the new uh, ICD-11 uh, classification, among others, but that's, um, so, so, so there are very concrete points that we may consider here. Ensure reasonable, flexible work adjustment uh, for workers. We have spoken about that, and then that can help support reintegration of people living with 
pain back into the workforce. That means also that we need to establish mechanisms for financial and rehabilitation support, and finally, that help um, recognize that good work is um, good for health. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to welcome Susie Macri, who's going to give a short intervention on behalf of people with arthritis in Europe. And she is an individual who has spondyloarthritis and fibromyalgia, and she's been involved in various research projects related to muscle seated conditions. But she's speaking on here in her role as chair of the European Alliance of Associations for Rheumatology, or ULA, Committee for Patients, called PARE. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, and thank you for inviting me. Yes, I'm going to talk about work uh, with chronic and musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, I just want to make a distinction here. Uh, when we talk about, uh, we usually uh, use this term um, uh, musculoskeletal di disorders uh, and uh, musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal diseases uh, interchangeably. But uh, what we mean with musculoskeletal diseases is mostly inflammatory diseases and musculoskeletal disorders are mostly degenerative uh, conditions. So I'm going to talk about uh, inflammatory diseases, uh, fatigue, and um, uh, the recommendations of Euler on, on work. Okay, I've got it. Okay, uh, inflammation increases the risk of musculoskeletal disorders at work because it increases psychological risk uh, via alterations in sleep. This causes fatigue and uh, depression and um, various mental uh, conditions, but it also increases social problems as people with inflammation uh, have to stay uh, at work so uh, they stay out of social life and also other uh, health problems as car cardiovascular problems. And in turn, this psychological risk with their RMD um, um, brings more inflammation and it is a vicious, uh, vicious circle. So you can imagine um, if there is uh, no pre-existing condition, the psychological risk can create an MSD and people with uh, RMDs are more vulnerable because the psychological risk can in, um, um, uh, make the MSD uh, worse. Fatigue, it's a, it's a symptom of many um, uh, musculoskeletal uh, diseases and it's uh, very wrongly managed at work because RMDs can uh, cause fatigue and then fatigue causes presentism and psychological uh, stress and this is again a visual circle uh, here and people are regarded as lazy if they have uh, fatigue and um, therefore um, they can uh, leave earlier uh, their workforce uh, because of uh, fatigue. A ULAR task force um, on work reinforces the need to keep people with RMDs uh, at work and good work. By good work, we mean, and she was said before, um, work that is uh, inclusive, that is, is, um, uh, gives people a, a voice, and that it treats people fair, uh, fairly. So this leads um, to a good quality of life. Um, RMDs are very, uh, one of the main causes of sickness absence in, in Europe and they can have an impact on work outcomes and productivity at all stages, even from the beginning when people enter the workforce, during the uh, work and uh, until retirement. But some people uh, retire early uh, because of, uh, of um, uh, this um, uh, 
conditions and uh, they can't continue work. So, and, and they retire early. The, this campaign, the Light and the Load campaign, was very important uh, for EULAR because EULAR is committed to a comprehensive agenda for the benefit of people living with RMDs. And the EULAR strategy aims to increase the participation of people living with RMDs in work by 2023. We have a shared interest with the EU Ocean in mitigating uh, human, economic and societal impact of people with RMDs in the workplace. And EULAR is proud to be a sponsor of Health Workplaces Light and the Loan uh, campaign. And to conclude, we believe it is a shared responsibility of all members of the society and all stakeholders, employers, employees, decision-making uh, centres uh, to support people with RMDs to participate in healthy and sustainable work. I think that was my last slide. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susie. And now the last statement uh, is by Yvonne van Zanen uh, on behalf of IF. P T H E. <laughs> thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very delighted that uh, we uh, also can give a statement. And it's about physiotherapists at work. So we don't uh, have only the conversation in the uh, treatment uh, uh, process, but we also uh, visit the workplace. Uh, so it's about supporting injured workers and workplace uh, representatives. Uh, my name is Yvonne van Zane and I'm the uh, president of the Dutch Association for Physical Therapists in Occupational Health and Economics and the vice president of the International um, Federation. And I want to uh, show you uh, what we do and how we do it in just four slides. Uh, so what you see here, uh, you all know a physiotherapist, I think, um, and we are uh, physiotherapists with additional knowledge and skills uh, by which we uh, are able to do ergonomic uh, workplace assessments on musculoskeletal uh, diseases. Um, after the assessment, uh, we can give advices on technical, organizational or personal adjustments. And also if there uh, is a disease or uh, a disorder present. And we also support uh, the colleagues and the employers uh, in how they uh, can best support their colleague uh, with complaints. So we uh, also uh, work together with the team. And it's uh, about personalized interventions. So we really try to uh, find out uh, together uh, what works best for this worker. I will also give uh, a case example, uh, like Sarah did. Um, this is a photographer, also a teacher on the photo academy. And um, it's a uh, woman uh, of 54 uh, years old, already uh, in this job for a long time. It slightly changes. Uh, she had to do uh, more desk work. And uh, while she has uh, numbness, uh, sensitivity loss in her hand and also muscle weakness, uh, she visited uh, a physician and also the neurologist. Uh, she was indicated for surgery. Um, but because she also wanted to have a look at her workplace, she involved us. Uh, can, can there be something wrong uh, at my work? Uh, so after an assessment, uh, uh, you can see it at the photo, uh, that she's far too low. Um, she has a fast uh, height of her seat and her desk. And the pressure on her muscles and on her nerve uh, could have caused the uh, uh, complaints. We don't know it for sure, but it was reason enough to uh, advise adjustments. Um, so she had an adjustable chair and an adjustable desk. Uh, we also facilitated a recovery by giving her um, uh, exercises, uh, that's with an app, so, so she can do it at her workplace. Uh, this is an example, though, so these aren't the exercises, just an example. 
And uh, we supported her also uh, in making healthy choices, doing uh, what's best uh, for her. So uh, strengthen her, her in uh, self-management. Uh, by this, uh, surgery could be prevented, and that's a nice outcome. But I uh, would li also like to um, yeah, think, uh, ask you to think about what would have happened if she was operated on. And the situation, the environment was still the same. I think uh, it could have been chronic um, problems. So to summarize, uh, I won't go into detail of this uh, figure. Uh, it's only to show you about the domains. Uh, this is already an old figure, but it uh, still applies uh, to us as a physiotherapist. Um, you, in the middle, you can see the worker with disability um, and the surroundings, that's the healthcare system, the red one, and the personal system, and also the coping uh, with the injury. Um, but you see the other two, the blue one and the yellow one, uh, that's the uh, workplace system and the insurance and leg legislative uh, system. That's also the domains um, we cover by doing this uh, kind of work. So, key points. Um, it's a shared responsibility of the employer and the employee. So, you ha really have to work together in this. It's multifactorial. Uh, we already heard it earlier, but yeah, it's, it's very important um, to know uh, the, the specific points for a patient, the specific details of a complaint, and also the specific uh, points at the workplace. Um, and the last one, work together. Uh, we use uh, evidence-based um, uh, method, participative economic approach. Uh, there are other ways to do it, but you really have uh, to work together. So that was my statement. So thank you very much. Uh, and now time for some discussion about what is the way forward on working with chronic MSDs. And as we've heard, how do we enable people to stay in work be fully productive, reduce presenteeism, reduce work loss, reduce people prematurely leaving the labor market. Uh, because across Europe, there's a shortage of workers. So there's a real need. And in a way, that gives us an opportunity to try and identify ways of making sure we aren't losing skilled workers. I know an engineering company in the UK, Rolls-Royce, recently did a study of how much it cost them because of people having MSDs. And it was enormous because they have highly skilled workers. And not only do they lose that worker, but they have to train up someone else to, to substitute. So it costs them double. So there really are economic cases as well. So comments. What do you think? needs to be done? Where are the priorities? What should we really be pushing for? Because we've heard that there's a lot of solutions out there. It's mainly getting the person to the right place at the right time. Uh, great system in Spain, but I know in many countries there's just not that mechanism of getting people that early intervention. So any thoughts or comments or questions? Yes? There's some online ones. We have a very active online participant. It's still Pedro Reis. <laughs> and he says, I'm, I'm just reading it out. Um, Unless there's an investment in education from the earliest years, that is from kindergarten on, so that attitudes and behaviors change at society's level, it will hardly be only the employers by themselves changing the bias towards handicapped people. Unless further investment is made in occupational health services and occupational medicine, the current situation will hardly change, in particular considering an aging population that will need no, uh, to work longer in healthy environments. Prevention will be key to achieve this. Yes. Thank you. So, any other comments? Yep. Sorry, Patrice? First, yep, and then... Okay. Thank you. Um, We've heard much about um, uh, awareness, many solutions for 
uh, implementing also um, uh, options in different kind of uh, situation and settings. Um, that's a question for, for you. Um, we haven't heard much about monitoring and appraising um, results of um, campaigns or things that we may um, have implemented. Um, could you comment on that? And my question could be more specific. Do you think that um, the uh, ICD-11 uh, classification might be um, a tool for that, at least for a certain uh, population? Okay, so I think we do, going back to that comment online, I think there needs to be a general increase in awareness of the importance of mustard seed or health. And I think it needs to be at the public level because I'm doing a lot of work with WHO trying to get them to be involved in this area. And they say they're not getting the requests coming in from the countries saying it's important. And that means their populations, because they're politicians, their populations aren't complaining enough. And I think one of the problems is people seem to accept that they become physically frail and they accept that they will get back pain in various jobs. There's a fatalism. Uh, people often suffer in silence and don't present themselves. So one problem I know in some early intervention programs is that the people themselves don't push themselves <coughs> forward early and they only present when they're about to leave the labour market because they can't cope anymore with their condition. So I think we do need to get people to value and as a clinician you often find people only value it if they have had the problems themselves uh, and then they say think, ah, oh, yes, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't get my you know, shirt on because I couldn't move my shoulder fully. I couldn't get things from the shelf, but they don't appreciate or value it enough. So I think we've got to change that. I think we've also got to get the data, and this is where ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, is important because it allows you to collect data. And we've got to make sure that that data considers symptoms such as pain as much as named conditions such as osteoarthritis, because in a way, is you know, almost irrelevant as to whether it has a condition, you know, it is an entity uh, and we need to get that information because we have found being involved in the Global Burden of Disease study where I showed a slide and Lydia showed a slide, that is actually getting people to recognise is important. But money counts and I think the economic is very important. So I think we have to highlight and I think it was very good from the presentations from the politicians, they were obviously recognising it's costly, uh, so I think that's very important. But then we've got to show that something can be done about it, because I think another barrier has been, okay, these problems are very common, but they happen and you can't do anything about them. So we've got to change that to be much more positive. Uh, and so it's a bit like cancer has totally moved from palliative care to really quite proactive interventions and almost an acute specialty. Uh, and I think we've got to really highlight this early intervention and the need to make sure that people get rapid access. But I think the main thing, I think, is to work out how do we get that to happen and whose responsibility is it? And I think probably it's something for everyone, but I mean, I don't know what people feel. Who is the most important person? Can we deal with it through rules and regulations and directives? You know, do we need to change those directives? But I think even the Commission sounds as though it's recognising that Commission directives don't work, but more guidance and probably more nudging people to do the right thing. May I also? Yes, so comments please from panel. <coughs> I'm not, well, I was, I was going to go back to the, the, the online statement. Um, and it, absolutely, we in EU OSHA think you should be starting from the kindergarten Onwards, and in fact, as part of the campaign, we had an on, we had an online seminar about um, mainstreaming educational actions on musculoskeletal health into schools. Um, one of the examples was called Jolly Black Backs, and then there's a I think there's a, some very good work going on in Austria and and Finland where in I think it's Finland where they actually try and create um, 
active learning spaces for for younger younger children um, pri at, pri at primary primary school. So they've they've been looking at an integrated approach to get activity going in in schools. Um, and then just a comment on the monetary part of things, because obviously in EU OSHA we're more focused on um, solutions in the workplace. And ha having been involved in the Good Practice Awards for this this year, when we when people submit their Good Practice Awards, companies submit them, they must also um, give us cost benefit information about that. So um, all. All the examples were showing a, a return on the, the on the in investment. Many of the solutions were um, very cheap to in introduce, especially with this worker participation. The one on the, on the maintenance, they actually got the maintenance workers to find the solution. And being maintenance workers, they I think a new trolley was needed to help to help them. And they built it from equipment within within the factory. So the good communication, whether it's for the individual rehabilitation or the solutions in the workplace, was absolutely key to that one. And multifactorial in the workplace and outside. So many in in, in the good practice cases, often they were having ergonomics programs to improve the, the situation, coupled with visits to physiotherapists, so they get um, um, both, both for advice on um, ergonomic setups and, and exercises and early, early inter intervention, um, and human resources working with occupational safety and health as well. And that, that was a feature that I saw. And then this, this third thing in, in the workplace ones, adding in also often looking at stress prevention issues alongside um, ergonomic um, prevention. Because actually we, our, our research shows that um, being stressed is a risk factor for developing a work-related musculoskeletal disorder. But I think and I won't go into the mechanisms, but there are physiological mechanisms that stress affect the musculoskeletal process. Um, so to look at the two together, whether it's for workplace prevention or whether it's for reintegration into the workplace. But somehow we need, our, our motto in EU OSHA is good health is good business, but a lot more work needs to be done to still get that message across that um, for small investment you can get big bigger big rewards and it's not necessarily complicated yes as I said in the UK we have a joint working uh, unit bringing together the labor ministry and the health ministry and it really gets the thinking around that investing in health has a payback in terms of productivity so I think Monica you were going to Yes, thank you very much. Um, in fact, I wanted to come back with a question to you. Um, so, <laughs> the, the, you, you hear me, yes? Okay, so I think the directives, they do work because they set the legal framework and they are very useful. It's just, you know, how to trickle down. And I think we, we always come back to the question of awareness, that employers are not aware, employees associations are not aware, public authorities are not aware. And here I wanted to come back with a question because we see so many good practices, but how to make a systemic change? And this is the question to you, this is the question to everybody. Who, who are the stakeholders who should be doing it? <laughs> so, I think, so this is my view, that I think you need to work with the unions representing the workers, also the various employer networks, but I think one problem I've noticed, and it's like here, I mean, it was good to see the awards were not necessarily all the great and big employers. Because I think we've got to remember that across Europe, most people are employed by SMEs. And where I live in Cornwall in Southwest England, it's micro SMEs. And clearly a lot of things that come through are not appropriate for them. 
So I think we've got to actually recognize that to get it more realistic, because otherwise it's a bit like, you know, trying to encourage someone to be a footballer by showing them a, a first division team, you know, it's, it's or, you know, Olympic runner when you're trying to start off. It, it, you're not get, it's going to put you off if you're not careful. You're going to decide it's impossible. You don't have those resources. I think the other thing are case studies, because I think once you talk to employers, there seems to be usually, a, I don't know if people agree, a will to do something, but they don't quite know how, and they're fearful that it's going to open things up. It's a bit like we always say that there should be open conversations. But I think, particularly with pain, often non-experts in pain don't want to ask the patient the question because they fear that they won't be able to answer it adequately and that they'll be there for a long time struggling and so they avoid asking. And I think in you know, the same with managers don't always ask because they aren't sure what to say back. So I think we've got to build that confidence and really emphasize, as Sarah was saying, about these are simple solutions, don't cost a lot of money. Susie might be able to comment, but yes. a lot of these people, people have learned how to adapt their lives at home at the weekends, yeah. and they can say to their managers, if you allow me to do this, yeah. I will be able to stay in work. I think we all agree, and uh, we all have said so, that it is very important for people with musculoskeletal diseases to remain at work because uh, this uh, gives an economic independence, it boosts self-esteem and self-confidence. So, but there is, I think here, Tony, a role for patient organizations on the national level for us to educate employers that we little adaptations. Um, sometimes it's not needed to do much. Uh, a few things, uh, um, having a um, more flexible um, working time, time uh, or um, giving some time for exercise, or allowing the person to go out and walk a bit. Little things, they can uh, facilitate people to stay at work and stay active. And that's good for productivity and for the whole economy and, and, and society. So I think that's important. I think a popular term is co-production. Yeah. And I think it is a thing of people working together. And a bit like designing work, new work processes in the, you know, or bringing in new equipment. I've had discussions with the transport industry about seating for train drivers. And it was quite clear they were not being, the drivers were not being engaged in the design of the seating. Uh, or consulted, uh, and not surprisingly, they were finding it unsuitable quite often. I would say that there, there, is, there is, a, is work to do still for um, those in the different organisations or stakeholders involved in occupational safety and health, including um, work, workplace safety officers to broaden their approach and not only look, look at prevention, but consider, take in and return to work as part of that approach. So return to work isn't just a human resources issue, that it, that it um, is part of, of um, their role as well. But that, or, uh, again, well, that will go back to initial tr training of occupational safety and health um, practitioners in, in the workplace. So it actually needs to go back down into their core training, which, which is often the, so the same said as for medical professionals, that they need a workplace aspect in. So they're, they're thinking about work as, as part of their treatment. So that was one point I quickly wanted to make. Another point that we find is that it, for prevention, and I don't see why not for rehabilitation practices, return to work practices, often the most effective way to work with employers is through sector organisations and sector social dialogue. Um, because they, they want examples that are relevant to their sector that they can un understand. So those countries that have good sector social dialogue um, 
systems uh, often produce the, the best um, prevention information. If they could be, be also focused on how to deal with to return to work, and with the se once you get the sector organisations involved, they have a network to get through to small business affiliates to, the, to their sector organisation. So that's often a very good way to to get through to them. And, that, and all countries who have better intermediate support programmes on whether it's for occupational safety and health or whether it's return, return to work, um, you find that they're, they're doing more in the workplace. Like the question was to Lars earlier, how do you reach the workplaces? And the, we already have good contact with them. So he's from the Danish Working Environment Authority. Denmark is kind of set up to have this, this good contact. So that's, it's, that's crucial. We see it, whatever you're talking about, it, the, the, the same things are crucial. And I'm seeing now it's the same pattern whether you want to promote prevention or good return to work. You need the, it's the same systems that you need in place. Okay, so I think that's a strong call to make sure that occupational safety remembers its safety and health, and there's more health promotion and also return to work, and that when it comes to inspection process and other things like that, that gets more built into it so that a good workplace is not only one which is safe, which is obviously first thing, but also supports health and supports employees to stay in work. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yes, I um, would like to say something about culture. Uh, we earlier heard it today, but I also think uh, for musculoskeletal health, uh, we have to realize that we are sitting uh, a lot more often and also our youngsters. So we really, really need a culture change. And when that also occurs in uh, organizations, that is uh, more normal uh, to exercise in between or to go outside and have your walk, uh, to incorporate uh, exercises uh, movement, that will really uh, be healthier uh, for the musculoskeletal uh, system. So I would encourage uh, the, the campaign of the AU uh, OSHA to also uh, support that. Okay, so I was going to say a quick, because I think our time is up, so a quick closing bullet point, and your bullet point is keep moving. Yes. Yes, and that has to be enabled and facilitated, etc. Yes, yeah. and also because uh, when it is normal in, inside the company, that's also easier when you get complaints. So when, the, uh, when you become a patient, then it's easier to have your movements in between. So, Patrice. Very quickly, uh, I like the, the, the wording universal design that was mentioned before. Very specific action points, but universal design, that's also about culture, that's, that's about awareness, that's about implementation, that's about impact. And impact is also about measuring or trying to quantify impact, but, but I like that idea of universal design. I think we have seen a lot of solutions and I don't think that one is best than the other. I think the most important thing is use everything and um, I think the main point is that um, we should communicate more okay, between the different domains. I think this is the main problem at the moment. Okay, so we've said that we do need an integrated holistic approach, but as you said, if we don't communicate and don't understand what each other does, etc., that cannot happen. So we need to more yeah. integrate. And a bit like the debates so of whether it is occupational health or rheumatology, who does it, whatever. I think if everyone was working close together, it, it, would, it would not matter. No. Okay. Um. I would say share your good practices, you know, on, uh, so, so they could reach us and then we could try to make a systemic change. Right. Um, 
Lydia stolen my point, <laughs> but I'm going to make it again just to underline it more. So I, I put down communication and participation at all levels, so inside the workplace and outside the workplace with everybody involved. I would say raising awareness about uh, rheumatic diseases and uh, work and collaboration between the different stakeholders for facilitating uh, people to enter the workforce and remain at work. Okay, and just coming on Sarah's statement, I think it's good that you emphasise it needs to be outside work as well as in work. Uh, so I think that's great. So I think we've got some key points there. Any other key points people feel we've missed? Anything you would like to see? Yep. Um, this was mentioned, but I would like to highlight again. Uh, nowadays, we are mostly talking about the change in the world of work. Uh, as this is mentioned in the uh, perspective of uh, musculoskeletal disorders, but as we know that um, we are not uh, diagn uh, diagnosing the occupational diseases, I mean the numbers are below expected. In most of the countries we are having the same problem. So uh, I think that uh, the design as what the ergonomic is uh, based on. It should be uh, human-centered, and also the change in the world of work should be human-centered. So this could be another uh, point. Thank you. So thank you very much. Sarah, do you want to make any closing comment? fully prepared for that. Um, I think we've had a, a really varied um, presentations and interventions from different, different um, or viewpoints or coming, coming from, from different um, organisations, um, healthcare and occupational safety and health and, and the and, and dis disability policy. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the messages, we're all concluding with, with, with the same messages about taking this integrated approach and combining prevention, good prevention with re rehabilitation, um, including um, Health, health care, having the early intervention in, in health care uh, with a focused role on, on getting people back to, back to work. And, and again, and it all come, comes down to, into the end with multidisciplinary systems where there's good communication and, and cooperation with the different, the different parts in, in the system. And the other main message now is um, we, we still have a lot of work to do, continuous work to do on raising awareness of, of how there are um, cost-effective practical solutions both within the workplace and within healthcare systems as well to support that return to the workplace. Thank you, and as a non-EU OSHA person, I'd like to thank EU OSHA very much for this campaign and all the work they've been doing because we've been trying to highlight the importance of MSDs for a long time and it's great to see an EU agency taking it forward and the high level of commitment we heard from the Commissioner, from ministers in Spain and in the Basque country, etc. So I think it's really important. But I think also we have to be aware, as we've just heard, that the job's not done and we have to continue to find ways of working together to implement a lot of the research which came out of the project and the campaign, 
the materials which are excellent, the case studies, there's a lot there and we've got to work as you were saying about how do we actually get people to change and I think we just need to make it quite clear to people what individuals roles are, what employers roles are and what policy makers roles are to really try and move the agenda forwards and upwards. So thank you to all the speakers and panelists, their contributions. Thank you for participating in the session and my challenge is to try and give some report back on this tomorrow. So thank you very much and hope to see you later this evening.